Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Silicon Global Online show, our Ask a VC show, which started during COVID and has been going strong ever since. We've had more than 60 episodes. Um, many of these uh, shows are on our YouTube channel. You can check it out, Silicon Global Online. And today's show will also be broadcast later on on YouTube. But today, you get a chance to ask a question during our show. So uh, when you want to ask a question, you can turn your camera on and unmute yourself. So I really appreciate everyone joining us today. It's really fun to be back to the meeting format where I can see everyone and hear everyone. And I hope that you agree that this format is a good one. So today uh, we are asking a very well-known venture capitalist in upstate New York and Northeast United States, Somak. Shadapadi, uh, okay, from Armory Square Ventures. And he has been running this fund since 2014. And I'll introduce him in a minute. But for those who haven't been on our show before, just a few words about what we're all about. We're all about content and this show and our events and books and newsletter and circle membership. So you can check all of that out. It's all housed on our website, silicondragonventures.com. And on Amazon, you can find my four books, uh, which are at this point, a series starting in China, going to Asia, going back to China, and then to the heartland. So this has been an interesting journey. But uh, today, I'd like to welcome Somak to the show. Hello, Somak, how are you today? I'm good. Good morning, Rebecca. I think it's morning your time, right? Um, um, uh, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, yeah. We have people on various time zones joining us. I'm in California, so it's still morning. Um, but uh, I understand you're in a cold climate today. I am. That's hence why I'm wearing the vest. I'm in uh, Toronto. We're here for uh, some diligence meetings for a, a near-term investment opportunity. So yeah, it is very cold here, I must say. I'm looking forward to some warmer weather, hopefully after this week. <laughs> okay, sure. Well, spring is on the way. Um, uh, in like a lion, out like a lamb. And uh, of course, today, oh, wow, leap day, leapfrog day, right? Um, that's right. <laughs> we can't repeat, this is our first show we've ever held on leapfrog day, so... Yeah, you're the, you're the winner <laughs> of the frog, I think. Uh, anyhow, um, so, so Max spends a lot of time in upstate New York around the Finger Lakes District in a place called, uh, well, I just abbreviated it here, Skinny Atlas. And if you saw the spelling, uh, you could see why I just uh, phonetically put it here, Skinny Atlas. Am I, uh -huh. am I right uh -huh. on that, Sumac? So okay. Uh, Samak has been a venture capitalist for quite some time. Uh, he founded Armory Square Ventures in 2014. And before that, he was with a few other venture funds, Tribeca Venture Partners, GSA Venture Partners. He was a manager at Edison Venture Fund. He's a board or director or observer, or at least, I almost lost count, I don't know, nine or 10 companies, Samak? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um Great uh, credentials, um, mechanical engineering degree, MIT, MBA, Columbia Business School, and he grew up in a cold climate, <laughs> Vermont. Uh, so a little bit about Armory Square Ventures before we uh, dive into our conversation. Uh, Samak launched it in 2014. There's an interesting story about why he launched it and how he launched it, but we'll ask him to tell that story. He manages $100 billion in funds and capital under management. He's betting on underdogs. Yeah, we love underdogs. <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, particularly those that are outside typical geographical markets. Uh, he focuses on the Northeast and upstate New York. And um, Samak, you mentioned that your firm is the only one that's north of the of New York City and the Empire State. Um, that's just one clarification. We are probably the largest institutional fund north of New York City. There are a few other uh, funds that have emerged over the last few years uh, that we partner with regularly. They tend to be smaller, but I believe we are the largest you know, returns oriented institutional fund north of New York City. Okay, well, that's a vast area. Uh, mm -hmm. Takes in the Catskills, the Finger Lakes, the Adirondacks, Buffalo, Rochester, uh, mm -hmm. 
a little bit of Niagara Falls. Um, so it's an interesting territory. Um, and SOMAC is, in, is investing in software, mobile, commerce, and tech-enabled services. So we'll get to hear a little bit about those kinds of deals he's been involved with. Um, Believe it or not, he's helped to create all these new jobs in upstate New York, and upstate New York needs those new jobs. So we're going to be talking about that as well, about how what are the new, what are the new drivers of um, jobs in in the state, um, and we'll be talking about some of his very successful deals, like the um, ACV auctions, the car auction site, which went public and a uh, huge um, IPO. So also, I want to say that please um, have your questions uh, ready to ask him, and I'm going to launch into uh, our conversation here. Look, hi, everybody. Wow, it's great to see everyone. Uh, if you want to turn your camera off, that's fine. If you want to mute yourself, even better. Um, so, all right. Um, so... I'd like to hear the story about how you started <clears throat> Armory. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> uh, I'll get it together in a minute as soon as I get this frog out of my throat. <laughs> um, sure. Yeah, okay. Uh, how did you get started with Armory Square Ventures? I like this story and I'd like everyone to know about it. Sure thing. Thank you so much again for having me on, Rebecca, and thanks to everyone for joining us for today's uh, today's conversation. Looking forward to your questions. So um, yeah, so Armory Square Ventures uh, uh, is, a, is a fund that's been around for over a decade. We, um, so as Rebecca mentioned, I've, I've been a venture capitalist for nearly two decades, did two startups before that, uh, one e-commerce company called Shopping.com uh, and a digital health company called MedTower. But most of my career has been leading seed and series A investments in high growth, primarily B2B software businesses. So in 2013, uh, uh, you know, Pia and I, uh, uh, you know, uh, left New York City uh, as we were recruited to really uh, address the early stage gap, you know, uh, you know, a gap that existed in markets, not just in upstate New York, but really in secondary cities across the Northeast and Midwest. But our initial anchor investors came from upstate New York. And so uh, this was really uh, almost a, a 10, 12 year project where all of our uh, early partners saw that, you know, until that time period, and it still exists a little bit today. And, you know, whenever, whenever companies were building, a, 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 you know, a, a, a company and launched uh, a commercial product and they saw some level of, of, of product market fit, if they were lucky enough to be able to secure an early stage lead investor, they were often asked to move to Silicon Valley, Boston, or New York City. And you know what happened was, you know, for some businesses that might make sense. If you're a financial technology company, you probably should have presence in New York City. If you're an AI-based company, you probably should have a very strong presence in Silicon Valley. But there are many industries uh, throughout the heartland, uh, is it, to use your phrase of your book, like where these are massive, massive industries, uh, industries yeah. like agriculture, construction, manufacturing, healthcare, where there's real deep roots in the, these secondary cities, but, and there's the talent pool, there's examples of successful companies, but there historically has not been uh, the capital partners available to not only write the check, but to be a catalyst for customers' talent and follow on capital. So that was a real idea behind Armory Square Ventures. We launched the fund in 2014. And um, we decided early on that we were going to really pursue a more of a craft approach to venture capital. We wanted to have a very deep, intimate relationship with each of our founders and be their advocates to really help them scale to become market leaders. That was really how our fund was born. Our first fund was a small fund, it was a little under 20 million. Um, but we're fortunate that that fund had multiple success stories, including ACV auctions, which we can talk about later, uh, a global auction marketplace that was about five people we invested is 2,000 people today. And we help recruit multiple C-level people to that team, uh, which we can talk about later. Bento yeah. Box, a, a, a market we have, uh, 40, that was, Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. we have 43 North on the uh, Zoom today. Oh, so. perfect. 43 North was one of the most important partners early on in ACV and continues to be a great partner for us. But we are now, we've expanded our mission from where we started in, in fund one to now as we invest out of fund three, our focus is to continue to focus on 
where we've been successful, namely some of these secondary cities across New York and the Northeast. But we are spending more time in some adjacent geographies. As I mentioned, I'm in Toronto today. Uh, you know, we spend time in Indianapolis where our partner in Nina is based. Uh, Columbus, Pittsburgh, we do see that they're very similar characteristics uh, in terms of what makes a company successful in those markets as well. Right. What's your view of the Heartland markets, how these markets are progressing and where does your own region fit in in comparison to some of the other cities in the Heartland like Columbus and Indianapolis, which are really booming? Yeah. Yeah. So I think, you know, I, I really love spending time in markets like Columbus and, and Pittsburgh. I've been spending, you know, if, if you mentioned Columbus, you know, there's been a, obviously a, a strong, um, you know, a, there's been a strong, you know, focus on bringing venture capital region that started with our friends at Drive Capital. And there have been other funds that have emerged uh, yeah. over the years, you yeah. know, Jumpstart in, in Cleveland. So I think yeah. there's a lot of great things that Ohio has that I think is really been an inspiration for those of us in New York State. I think, uh, I think you know, when I look at how upstate compares to these other markets, um, I don't think of it as a competition. I think we all have very, very, I think it's a very collegial collaborative community. I think we all are being trying to be advocates for a region, but we all face the same, some of the same challenges too, namely getting recognition, being, you know, uh, being showcased by the, some of the key thought yeah. leaders and being in a conversation uh, where a lot of the tech, you know, uh, media takes, you know, where a lot of discussions takes place, which is often in Silicon Valley or New York. I think we also have to really, you know, celebrate our wins. We don't have the density of companies clearly that a Silicon Valley or even New York City has, right? But I think that, you know, we have so many of the important ingredients of what will make a company successful, not just the talent, the strong university partners, the quality of life, the lower cost of living. And now, um, if, you know, if you look at some of the, uh, you know, recent investments that companies like Micron, Intel, TSMC are doing as a result of the CHIPS Act, a lot of those companies are bringing tens of thousands of engineers to our backyards. And that's going to be great for us as we try to grow the talent pool of our existing companies. And some of that talent, you know, or people who are affiliated with the people moving here uh, are ultimately going to found their own startups or want to join startups. So I think that's something that we're incredibly bullish about. And I think one last thing I'll say is that the pandemic was really a major catalyst for the virtualization of the workforce. And many people used to historically live in New York City, but have a weekend home in the Catskills or go to these other markets in the summertime. And when it became clear through platforms like Zoom and Teams and other collaboration platforms that you can build a company more remotely, but still spend time in person where appropriate, it you know doesn't really make sense to have customer service in QA in New York City or Silicon Valley when you have some of the best talent for that in markets like a Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse, or Indy or Columbus. Those are all things that I think are really exciting trends and tailwinds for uh, funds like ASV. Yeah, well, I'm sure that your town drew a lot of remote workers during COVID and they probably want to stay because it's a beautiful place uh, right on the Finger Lakes area. So tell us about uh, tell us about uh, what you can see out your window normally from your office there. Yes, I, I wish today I had I I'd scheduled the interview. Yeah, sorry. I, 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 so I wish I, this is also beautiful, but I would have, I wish I could have, I, I did show uh, uh, Rebecca some pictures, I think, uh, in, in a prior discussion about, about Skinny Atlas. So yeah, we, I, I live in a town called Skinny Atlas. P and I moved there, as I said, over uh, 10 years ago. It's spelled S-K-A-N-E-A-T-E-L-E-S. And yes, I know I have a very long name. I live on a, a street that also has a very long Iroquois name. I, you, I, it, it helps to be a good speller when you live in this town. But it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful town that is. Um, um, it's basically thirty minutes from Syracuse, a little less than an hour away from Ithaca. It's the easternmost city of the Finger Lakes, and uh, the, the 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 town is right by uh, a body of water, Skinny Atlas Lake which means long lake in the Iroquois language, that's considered one of the cleanest bodies of water on earth. So it's a breathtakingly beautiful uh, part of the world. Our office is actually on the lake. Our conference room opens up onto a dock. So it's kind of, oh. it's a very unusual setting for a venture fund. 
Uh, but we've used it as a real tool to recruit talent, not just for our team, but for our portfolio companies. And uh, it's it's yeah, it's uh, absolutely beautiful. And CJ, yes, CJ says he can attest. He has definitely visited us in the past, and we hope he continues to visit from Forty Three North. Um, so that's where we live. It's not just the natural beauty of the of the town that gets us excited, though. I think this is true about many parts of upstate New York and the Midwest. Um, you know, it's also just the the people. The people are in our town are optimists. They take incredible uh-huh. pride um, about some of the past successes. But when we have a success in our company, in our fund, in a portfolio company, they say, how is our company doing? How is that portfolio kicking ass? Like, how can we help our fund uh, succeed? And there's just a real community-oriented approach, which is something that we find very, very special. We're a returns-oriented fund, but yeah. it was very important for some of our early investors, especially the individual investors that we create a, a, enough of a robust for a venture ecosystem so that young people after graduating from college there's hundreds of universities in this region but after they graduate and they want to start a company or join a company that they have the opportunity to do that where they grew up uh, that has been a huge mark of pride for any of us on our team that obviously have been some great success stories but it's also the fact that there is this optimism we view ourselves as optimism engines for these uh, secondary cities yeah, that definitely bodes well for entrepreneurship. You got to stay optimistic. How is the culture adapting to this kind of more startup environment that we're all living in today? It seems like so many people want to have their own business. They don't want to work for big corporate any longer. Yeah, uh, you asked just broadly how how people look at startups today. Is that what your question? Yeah, but what's the culture like? Is uh, has the culture adapted to the kind of like in California? There's so many people who do uh, startups and you know other tech hubs, um, but in upstate New York, has this kind of the idea of not having a traditional job, but actually doing a startup and having that, you know, that different kind of culture uh, embedded into people's lifestyles. Correct. Is it yeah, changing? so it's changed, a, it's changed a lot. And I want it to change even quicker, I have to say, like, I think, but it is changed. It's changed a lot, especially over the last few years. Um, so I think, you know, when, I, when when we moved to upstate New York 11 years ago, um, it was considered very unusual to not work at an M&T bank or, mm-hmm. um, you know, at the, in, our, in our backyard, Welch Allen, which is now part of Baxter. The idea was you went to college and then you worked in a traditional corporate job in a large company, right? And, you know, as it was really, I think, 2020, 2021, as we started seeing some success, not only with ACV, but a bunch of other companies all across upstate, um, you know, that we, and, and these other cities were, were, were raising real rounds, not just that first million, two million, but growing, scaling to 100, 200 plus people, raising much more follow on capital from Silicon Valley and other markets. That was something that really, again, made people think differently, saying, oh, wow, that's not just a one off circumstance, it's actually a real possibility to build a world-class company in our backyard. So I think, you know, the, the, the mentality has changed a lot over the last few years. Once you, we've seen this, we saw this happen in New York City where I started my career, right? New York City was historically a finance town. I know you've spent time, a lot of time in New York too, Rebecca, right? And you still do, mm-hmm. right? It was considered de classe to join a startup. But I think at times when these larger industries are in transition, there's so many industries going through so much transition. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense for people to leverage their backgrounds and expertise and then create something that can be really something very unique and create jobs and scale. So I think there's definitely many more people who are interested in startups. I would say, you know, there's definitely, you know, if you're building a company in this in this environment, though, whether you're in upstate or the Midwest or in New York City or Silicon Valley, you have to really, really want to do it in this environment because there were a lot of tourists uh, that were building companies, raising money, just like, you know, just you just had an idea and you just got a check, right? Um, that environment, there are certain areas of AI where we still see this happening, but in general, it's much, much more difficult to secure that first round, to secure the following capital. To, you know, it's a very different environment since uh, the interest rate environment changed and since we saw right. some of the market corrections. So that that has definitely impacted everyone, including our region. But I think that um, I think that's a healthy part of, of the boom and bust cycle. Okay. So these new jobs that have been created in upstate New York... Uh, can you give us some examples of what kind of jobs these are and how much training is needed for them? Are they all tech jobs or what kind of jobs are these? 
Yeah. So it's, it's, you know, what we find, um, you know, you, you had a, some, an earlier slide that talked about how we yep. invest in software, mobile and tech enabled services. So when you look at the whole area of technology enabled services, I think that very is a good way of characterizing a lot of companies that we've invested in that are at, at the core, they are software businesses. They are high gross margin businesses with repeating and recurring revenues, but there is a, still a critical need for people. So it's not like I know WhatsApp, I can't remember. It was like a very, very small number of people when they went public, right? It was like a team of engineers and that was really it, right? That's generally not the type of companies that we're backing. We're often backing companies that are looking to really use the capital to secure uh, funds to, re to to recruit people in in operations, in marketing, in customer service, account management, you know, a bunch of areas where there's still people involved interfacing with various constituencies, customers, channel partners uh, to help them grow, right? And I think that that's been part of the tradition of a lot of the companies in these markets historically, right? It often from larger companies. So those are often, when we look at the kind of the, the key areas where companies are, are recruiting when we invest, which is generally seed in series A, it's often yeah. to recruit engineering talent, uh, sales talent, but often other 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 areas as well uh, that are that are that are in, in account management, customer service. We ourselves spend most of our time helping to recruit people at the C level, heads of sales, heads of marketing and technology, but then working with them to tap their networks to grow the teams under them. I see. Is there enough talent today to fill all of these new jobs that are coming in in the tech space? I particularly like in semiconductors. It's a real focus right now is that we do right now we do feel that we have a lot of the talent that we need to tap for companies but and but at the same time we we don't just rely on people who are local right i i just one of the things okay. one of the reasons that our team spends so much time in markets like new york city and even silicon valley is that we often are trying to find people who grew up in these regions who went to school in these regions and especially once they get to a certain stage of life where they're like you know i like maybe some people like going out in the city every night i love spending time in the city we we keep the place in the city and they're regularly in new york but the you know, reality is at a certain point where quality of life does matter, community, schools, all those things, and um, it becomes easier to recruit those people, right? Yeah, so, so, so we find that we always are talent scouts trying to find those people in these other markets. And I think your question is, will we be able to fill those jobs? I mean, there's definitely a, a real concerted effort, not, a, not only where we have office in Syracuse and Yalis, but where our, our colleagues in Buffalo and Rochester are going to really combine our, our, our talent networks and all the people affiliated with the universities and corporations and, and companies in the region to really fill the void across the region. Because if you look at the broader geography of a market like upstate, I think the same thing would apply to the Midwest, right? You know, if you look at the, the, the time it takes to go from, um, you know, Buffalo to Syracuse, probably, yeah, I don't know how long it takes you, or Rebecca, to go from where you live near SF to Silicon Valley, but probably not that different, right? When you factor in traffic. And we have these clusters of talent that are across these different cities that I think we really focus on finding ways to cross pollinate. Our name is Armory Sport Ventures. It just happens to be uh, where we were originally founded, but we made it very clear early on that we had to find a way to tap talent pools all across uh, this region, not just one particular area like, like Syracuse. Right, so being kind of a big fish in a smaller pond, does that allow you to have better results on your funds, on your investments? Um, so, well, yes, I, I, I would say that there, the, you know, if you look at the basic you know, the laws of investing and finance, you know, I think inefficient markets, uh, as, as uh, the great investor Howard Marks says, are, are markets that are poorly understood, opaque. And if you have a real, real deep understanding of how those markets work, you can yeah. truly, you know, help in our case, back great companies and ultimately generate superior returns. Okay. I will say though, that you have to be super careful. Like I, the phrase big fish in a small pond is something I've heard other founders ask me about, like, hey, interesting when an entrepreneur is building a great company, Ithaca or Buffalo or Syracuse. And what I say often to them is that you have to be very careful about not confusing the fact that you are in a market where you can be one of the top you know, uh, companies in a region with how you'll be perceived by investors and strategic partners and acquirers down the road, right? Like at the end of the day, if you're going to be raising capital, 
from any venture fund, if you're going to be one day be at a point where you might go public or want to be acquired by Google or Meta, it doesn't matter if you're the best company or fund in Syracuse or Ithaca or Buffalo, you have to be the best in the industry. And if anything, I would argue that the bar is even higher because oftentimes people are, have their deep biases and like, do I want to acquire the team that's like 30 minutes away from me in Mountain View or do I want to really acquire someone who or work with someone who is in Buffalo or Rochester. So I think that, I think at the, you, you do have to work much harder, I think, to prove you know, your, your bona fides. But, but you also, I think one of the things we always tell our, our entrepreneurs is make sure you're always spending time in these larger tier one markets like New York and Silicon Valley. Things are moving at a rapid pace and you need to really understand who you're, content, who you're competing with you know, mm -hmm. what are the key trends and, and not be in your own bubble. So I guess what I'm saying is that there's definitely huge advantages of the fact that you are, um, you are, you know, often kind of one of the only people to, to really be able to do your job and that you have a big competitive advantage. But the flip side is you, you can also become siloed and live in your bubble and not realize how quickly the world is changing. I think that's something right. we, we, we think a lot about at ASV. Right. And you're co-investing with some of these other venture capital funds. So that's good. That helps to broaden the horizons, I think. And Absolutely. I want to ask you, yeah, I want to ask you about some of your deals as well, uh, the good and the bad. So let's talk about the good first. Um, mm -hmm. How about that auction, that car auction site? Uh, tell us about that. How did that deal come about? Uh, how much did you invest? Uh, what kind of return did you get on it? Are you still holding shares in it, et cetera? Sure thing. I can talk at uh, broad brush strokes. I, I you know, I, I, I high level about the company and also okay. uh, but to be careful because I'm in a quiet period, so I can be careful about certain things about David. But it's, I, you know, I, I, hopefully from what I'll share with you, you'll appreciate that there's been some amazing returns from there and some other companies as well in our fund. Uh, for ACV, you're talking about this was a company that uh, CJ's uh, organization 43 North uh, had accepted as part of their, their, their 43 North competition, which is a a business plan competition that takes place in in Buffalo every year, and uh, we um, we've actually first found out about the founders actually when they were in an incubator called Z80 Labs, which was started by a very very talented uh, and, and and successful operator investor named Jordan Levy. Uh, that was actually so Z80 was one of the early microprocessor chips, and it was one of the early incubators in Buffalo. So we thought it was a really interesting opportunity. They were focusing on creating a an automated platform for the automotive industry to really help dealers buy and sell wholesale used cars. Um, and historically, before ACD came into the picture, everything was done really through traditional physical brokers. People would come to the dealership saying, which cars are you looking to sell? We'll bring it to an actual physical auction and come back. And with mm -hmm. companies like Amazon and eBay existing for many years, even when, when this company started, it was fascinating that in 2015, people were still using physical brokers. That, by the way, that still exists today in other industries that we aren't investing in, right? So there, there is a digital transformation that is happening in industries that you know we we, we see happening, like what happened at ACV. So ACV, we helped uh, work with Joe Neiman and, and and the team to persuade George Shamoon uh, to join at the Series A. I work. We we partnered with my former fund, Tribeca Venture Partners, Jordan Levy, uh, and a few other uh, well-known angel investors. And um, yeah, the, as I mentioned, the company started off initially as a as a as a fund as a company that was doing selling a lot of cars in upstate. Then it started becoming the dominant player in the Northeast and the East Coast. Then through the Midwest and South and the West Coast. And then it, one of the most exciting days, really probably in my entire professional life, was watching the team uh, ring the bell at Nasdaq in 2021. We remember how for every entrepreneur, you know, it's so. The, the, the early years are so harrowing and Joe was yeah. telling us, you know, right before he rang the bell about how, you know, it was so difficult to cobble together that first 100,000, 200,000, the first million or the 5 million that we invested with our Series A syndicate. And sure enough, now, obviously, you know, everyone in the world has started to trade that stock and just sent chills down our spine. So that was a great story for, for Upstate, for Buffalo, and has inspired other entrepreneurs to follow their example. And what's also exciting is when you see the flywheel created in terms of lineages or lineages of, of, of entrepreneurs. So in Silicon Valley, where I know you spend a lot of time, you see many second, initially you saw second, third generation 
Fairchild Semiconductor companies and Intel companies, and now later Google and eBay and Amazon. And what's exciting for us is now that we're, we're looking and evaluating multiple companies that are second, third generation ACV entrepreneurs today uh, in this region. And again, this was you know just was not even ten years ago, and we're seeing numerous companies emerge that came from that original lineage, which is that's that's critical, I think, in venture ecosystems. Well, that's so that great. company it went public. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. It's a good story. Uh, and I'm glad CJ is on the line to hear about it as well. And of course, he also was part of it. So um, yeah. I want to also mention, um, I said the good and the bad. So the bad, well, it's not so bad. But uh, during COVID, uh, you know, eating became like a huge issue, right? Eating, I do eat, can't eat out anymore. How do you get food delivery? How do you get quality food? Prices going up. And so you had a, a deal that addressed all these issues. Uh, can you talk about that deal and yeah. what happened with it? Yeah, uh, sure, absolutely. The company um, is a company that was called Real Eats. And um, it really, it, uh, it really uh, was uh, started by uh, a CEO, Dan Wise, who had a real passion for creating healthy food that was easy, accessible. And he was sick of just relying on microwave options or ordering out. He wanted healthy uh, nutrient packed food that was, uh, you know, w would be equivalent to eating at a, at a fine restaurant, but with all the, you know, with, with just very, very healthy and, and, and something that basically uh, served a variety of different diets. So if you look at, you know, a lot of the, the, the you know, the talent that exists in places like the Finger Lakes, which is where our, our office in Skinny Atlas is based. There's a huge history of, there's a long, long history of, of agriculture, wineries, um, you know, lots of farms that are all across across New York State. And so this company w uh, really uh, developed a technique that was modeled after sous vide. Are you familiar with sous vide, like uh, for, for cooking, right? To help you warm up the cuisine and putting into putting these packets into boiling water. And then within minutes, you have something that tastes like a chef prepared meal. So absolutely, when, when, the, when the pandemic hit, when all the restaurants shut down, I mean, I, not only were we using, P and I were using this at home, but we were serving this to all of our team members at Army Score Ventures when portfolio companies came over. Like people were like, do you really work for ASV or do you work for this company? We were, we took our, our role as, as, as being uh, part of really very seriously. We really love the product. Um, but I think the company really became, you know, a victim of the higher interest rate environment. It was a more capital intensive operation. And mm -hmm. it was just very difficult to sustain, you know, the level of, uh, you know, capital needs that the company needed, despite tremendous growth. The company was growing, uh, you know, it had, you know, mid eight figures uh, in terms of, of revenue growing at a very, very rapid rate. But ultimately, uh, you know, the financing required to fund those things became much, much more difficult to access. So that was painful when, you know, the company couldn't continue on in its current form. Um, but I honestly, you, you learn so much more from some of those companies, you know, than the ones that are the rocket ships, right? Like it's really, you know, it's, 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 it, it, it was, it was an important company that for us to back. But I think what also, you know, with something we forget as investors is that, we, we we normally invest in, in areas like software that can have the opportunity to grow at astronomical rates in a very capital efficient way. But most industries have a natural growth rate and have a certain level of capital needs. It just doesn't matter whether you use software technology. At the end of the day, a food business is a very complex operational business. And yeah. when capital was plentiful, that was easier to do. It was much more difficult in a, in a capital scarce environment. So has this founder opened her own restaurant now in Skinny Atlas? <laughs> we, I want to go. We, we, I wish. Well, that's another topic. We, I am absolutely. You know, we love. Uh, uh, you know, we love investing in food tech, partially because we love food and we love merging those interests with technology. Um, we do still, you know, uh, keep in touch with some of the people on the team. Actually, one of the people we recruited to uh, really uh, as a COO was actually. Uh, a, a CEO of a former company uh, that we had invested in the food tech space called Good Uncle that was acquired by Aramark. Uh, he now works for uh, Stephen Starr, uh, the famous restaurateur in Philadelphia, where he runs the innovation department. So we, one of the things that's great about companies, whether they're great successes or even if they don't pan out, is that there's always opportunities to continue collaborating with them on their next on their next venture. 
Oh, that's good. So what are you seeing today uh, that excites you about the tech world? Um, and please don't say AI. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think what excites me the most about the tech world is something I touched upon earlier is the talent migration trends and the opportunities uh, to really tap that talent in old line industries that are in the early stages of, of, of digital transformation. So let me use an example. We talked about automotive, uh, the automotive industry in 2014, 2015, all using yeah. brokers, no marketplace business, no SaaS businesses per se. Now you have ACV, you had a few other companies that followed their example and have grown and scaled and exited. Yeah. I mean, just go to now 2023, we invested in a company called Machinery Partner, which is a, a, a B2B marketplace for construction equipment. So we're ACV focused on used cars. These people, this company focuses on equipment that can be worth 20,000 up to hundreds of thousands, right? And the same exact trend, you know, these are industries where right now it's mostly dealers and brokers, not right. very much technology, no real e-commerce sites. So that right. excites me is that there are multiple industries, whether it's a construction, manufacturing, agriculture, operations, trucking, logistics, all industries with deep, deep roots in our markets that are not the general focus of Silicon Valley in New York. And they're going through a level of, I'm not using the word AI, although AI is part of it. They're, 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 they're adopting digital technologies and trans, you know, tech enabling their business at a pace that, you know, was never, you know, it's, it's just been incredible exponentially over the last few years. So that's, that's something that we find very exciting. And I think the other part that I find exciting is just the availability of talent. So part of what we're saying is that talent is migrating into these secondary cities, but also historically, in up to even about two years ago, it was almost impossible to tap certain types of engineering talent, sales and marketing talent, because they were all you know, employed by Google or Meta or Microsoft. And while those companies are still are employing a lot of that talent, we're finding it's getting easier and easier to, to tap that talent today uh, because those companies are going through lots and lots of layoffs. And they, 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 a lot of these people sometimes felt that these companies provided a sense of job security. The reality is, is that while startups can sometimes seem like a risky bet, if you happen to have a senior position in a company that's well-funded and scaling, you actually have a lot more leverage in that organization, right? You, you're really needed. You're not one of a thousand engineers in a large organization. So that's something that I'm also excited about from a tech perspective. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point, I think, uh, because here in Silicon Valley, there have been a lot of layoffs. And actually, I wanted to get into the uh, topic of venture capital and um, the cycles of venture capital. So right now, uh, we went through this boom period, which was crazy during COVID, that uh, actually venture capital accelerated. But now we're on the downside, uh, maybe because of interest rates. I mean, why do we have a downside now in venture capital I mean, only escalated by maybe generative AI. Um, and uh, when do you see that this cycle will begin to pick up again? Right. I mean, cycles are common in pretty much every part of the economy. And, and I think Howard um, Marks has another book called Mastering the Market Cycle. I think that's really has a great has a great history of, of cycles. Everyone's heard of the tulip mania in Holland, you know, but they've existed <laughs> You know, for as long as human beings have existed, right? People go from states of being way too bearish to becoming somewhat more excited, and then suddenly insane levels of optimism. And then you have people trading NFTs and doing. Uh, we don't do anything in the area as much as a Web three, but you know, there's there's a bunch of things that felt like they were definitely like peak bubble type of activities, and that's yeah. definitely subsided a lot, right? But that's just the natural ebb and flow of how markets work. Um, and I, so I think in general, the, the combination of the higher interest rate environment, you know, as well as just, you know, a bunch of, you know, at, you know, as the capital markets became more scarce, like the music stopped and then you started seeing a lot more focus on getting to profitability versus focusing on growth for growth's sake. I think that's a very healthy thing, right? So I feel, yeah, I think there was a Josh Wolf at Lux Capital. I think he publicly stated that he believes our industry will shrink by 50%. I think it's, it's, if it's similar at all to 2008 or even 2000, 2001, it'll probably be at least 20, 30%, right? And I think that's a healthy thing. Um, at the end of the day, like there is, you know, often some, when there's too much capital sloshing around, ultimately, there's too many Me Too competitors that are created. And then there's just a bunch of other yeah. people who are tourists that aren't really focusing on 
long-term right. fundamentals like and looking at this as a longer term asset class right so i think um i think that it's a very difficult time to raise venture capital funds or funding but there is capital that has been raised like there's real huge amounts of capital raised in the last year or two and so I, it's more discerning today but i think frankly that should have been the case before too i think there was really people who were feeling the compulsion, they felt the need to just do investments and kind of just put money to work. I think the day our business is not to do a hundred investments. We're hired by our investors to ultimately manage a portfolio that where we know the inner fundamentals of the company and help create value and help generate returns. Right. right, right. Yeah. By being more selective in this kind of down cycles, um, sometimes you can see the best returns coming up as a result. So the best companies materialize. So kind of counterintuitive, but <laughs> I've seen it many times and I'm sure you've seen it a dozen more times than me. <laughs> well, it's also, it's interesting, you know, I, I know I'm quoting a bunch of other investors here, but you know, Warren Buffett said, what's he say? I think it's easier to, you know, as I'm totally butchering this, but I think how does, you know, it's easier to see who's swimming naked when the tide turns out, right? Something, you know, some variation of right. that, right? Oh, yeah. But it's really, yeah. it's, it, it's really so true though, right? In this current environment where a lot of people are, are, are really consolidating their technology spending, removing a lot of vendors, which aren't solving must have critical issues, right? right? Everything is a lot of cost cutting in the larger fortune 50, fortune mm -hmm. 100, you know, technology world, right? If a company is growing in this environment, that's like unbelievable. Right. That's like, you know, this is a true must have versus nice to have versus okay. something that's COVID fueled or fueled by low interest yeah. rate environments where it's just money. That capital can cover a lot of sins and you can get a sense of growth just because there's capital session. But a lot of people are now have to focus on growing through customers. And to us, it's like getting easier to understand what's truly a high growth business versus something that's not a core high growth business that, that can be venture scale. Right. And sometimes they call those hobbies. For entrepreneurs who actually, well, would be entrepreneurs who actually start something, but it's more of a hobby than a high growth company. It stagnates at some point. So it becomes, okay, my hobby. Um, so let me see if there are any questions, because we do have a number of good people here, um, including maybe one or two LPs as well, limited partners who actually invest in venture capital funds. So let's see who wants to turn on their camera and ask a question. <laughs> okay, Douglas Lee. Yeah. Douglas, tell us who you are. Hi, Douglas. Okay, well, I'm a longtime friend of Rebecca's, and I really admire Sweet what she job. does. Yes, yes. Uh, so what I do is I, I invest, I advise and invest in startup companies, primarily educational technology companies. So I have actually two questions. One is uh, uh, a lot of what you do, Samak, uh, it was pretty much goes hand in hand with what a lot of economic development organizations do. And so I was wondering uh, whether or not uh, you do much together with uh, Empire State Development uh, because you create jobs and they want to create jobs. And also, uh, you know, they provide incentives for angels that are going into companies that are starting up in New York mm -hmm. State. So that's that'd be good the first question. Yeah, okay, let's get, first... let's get the answer to that one first. Okay. 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 Sure. Uh, so, you, you, yeah, so we, in terms of your question is, I, is how do we work with other economic developers? And I'm so glad you you cited uh, Empire State Development. And Doug, are you based in New York? Where are you located? I'm uh, based in New Jersey. Oh, very nice. It's great to it's great to know that you know some of the the organizations that are in our in our community. Uh, so, big big fans of of Empire State Development, and they I think were have, have been partners to 43 North and. A few other funds that I know are in our region and co-invested in some of our companies. Um, so uh, I, we look at our world as being complementary to the people in economic development. Like in truth, our 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 our, our truthfully, our our fund was born by a group of people who care deeply about economic development, uh, including an organization in New York State called Center State CEO, uh, which is, stands for the Center for Economic Opportunity. So it's one of the largest chambers of commerce in, in all of upstate New York. And they have a set of activities focusing on philanthropy and economic development. But as another set of activities they wanted was focusing on really stimulating the venture capital ecosystem, which is how we came into the picture. But what was important, and I was found it very, very unusual about 
how forward thinking they were. They understood when I explained how we would be starting the fund. I said that we can't conflate two different ideas in one fund. Like there are funds that have an economic development focus first, and then there are funds like Sequoia and Kleiner and numerous other venture funds in the world that are returns oriented. We are in the, the latter category. Now we happen to be in a market like upstate where we believe that's where we have our edge, where we can generate alpha. But we also think that when you're lucky enough to have some big successes, that it, 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 it has the, the region succeeds and there's lots of jobs created. But the primary focus for us is not jobs or economic development. The primary uh, you know, focus for us is backing great companies, attracting great following capital, and seeing liquidity and, and showing great returns. So that's how we look at it. But we do find that we really do value our partners at Empire State Development, other economic development organizations, because there are numerous companies that can sometimes benefit from non-dilutive funding or from the incentives. Like every, there's a, there was a program started that ACD took advantage of called Startup New York, which says that you know you know you're able to you don't have to worry about paying payroll taxes. You get you know you 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 have a bunch of different interesting incentives that then encourage people to move and they get more bang for their buck when people are moving. They, it's not just the lower cost of living. It's the fact that you're not paying the certain sum of the taxes that you would pay in other environments. So we really value the things that these organizations do. At the end of the day, though, we are entirely returns oriented. Yeah. Okay. We do have a question here from Pilot Bird. Uh, so uh, Douglas, if we have time, we'll come back to your second question. But okay. Pilot Bird has uh, put a question here and has turned on his camera. So Pilot Bird, go ahead. <laughs> Thanks, Rebecca. Um, my name is Evgeny Alexandrov. I'm founder of Pilot Bird. We help insurance carriers detect fraud and uh, lower insurance premiums overall for everyone. My question to you is nice specifically you. around uh, your relationship with founders. As a fund that's oriented towards profit, um, you know, can you talk about situations where you did have a conflict with the founder? How did you mitigate it? And what's your general approach in partnering with founders? Thank you. Thank you. It's a very good question. Um, so you, you, I think your question is, so how, the, what's the nature of how we work with the founders and how we deal with when conflicts arise? Because there's a profit-seeking motive, and that might not be the same exact, you know, we might not have the exact same uh, motivations as a founder, right? Um, so I think in general, what we try to do, as, you know, very early on before we partner with the founder is we really want them to be comfortable that they're raising venture capital as a product, right? Um, my, my partner, uh, my venture partner, Michael Koppelman's uh, brother wrote a really great post about, do you, are you, you know, are you a motorcycle or are you a gen engine? Motorcycles are amazing, amazing and, you know, uh, machines, right? But bad things happen, you know, he said, when you put jet fuel into a motorcycle, right? And I'm just using that example because there's a lot of companies there's, you know, which, which are just phenomenal high profile machines, but, you know, I think got the, you know, a read in the press that they should raise venture capital. And then they find out that their, their objectives are misaligned because and from a venture capital perspective, I say this very clearly with any founder we back is, we know very few companies will never get there, but we need to make sure that you have a path to being a hundred million dollar you know, ARR business over time, right? And for many companies, you could raise, you could you could get to 10, 20 million, not raise a lot of capital, have a massive exit for and be life-changing for the founder. So make sure early on that we have the same objective of success. If you're feeling, of, if your uh, the definition of success is not, you know, getting to that level of scale, if that's not the only thing that gets you excited about this company, there, I would not suggest raising venture capital. Now, once you basically identify that this is the product that you want and you found the right partner to work with, so much is about chemistry rapport and the style of, of what you seek in terms of how you work with your partners. We are very active investors. What that means is we welcome companies that want our input and thoughts and advice and leverage our relationships to help, especially in recruiting talent customers and, 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 and follow on capital. So that's what we spend a lot of our time. We're not focusing in the minutia of operating. Um, that's, we make a bet on the founder, we're betting on that CEO, she or he is the leader we're focused on backing. But at the end of the day, we've been through the whole journey of speed through IPO or big, or big exits over and over again. And we're here to share those, those experiences. Now, in terms of conflicts, they arise, they do arise, they do come. For the most part, when things are going really well, 
and you know you know that you're going to be able to raise that series b or c to get to a great exit you know uh that you you still might have some you know conflict is healthy but that's not generally where most of the issues happen the issues typically arise when you thought as a both a founder investor that the company would show you know incredible nonlinear growth but the market is saying something else and you know then how do you deal with it does it make sense to take an exit earlier does it make sense to uh, potentially get to cash flow profitability. Those are the discussions which make a lot of sense. You need to have ability to do something and not just look at it through the lens of whether you're an investor or a founder who's also an employee of the team. This is where independent directors play such a critical role, yeah. right? I think some, that, and that's one of the things that we spend a lot of time trying to encourage our founders. I know a lot of people read about the whole independent you know, firing of Sam Altman and then him coming back. And some people, I know certain founders like, is that going to happen to me? I don't know if I want independent. And I can't tell you enough how critical great independents are to prevent those conflicts of interest. And to someone who's been in the founder's shoes before and can help really mediate conflicts that could arise between the investors and founders. That's a great point. Thank you so much. We have time for one quick question and answer. So Douglas, do you want to uh, chime in again or does someone else want to Take that spot. I'll give someone else a spot if, unless there's nobody. Rebecca. Okay, go ahead, Douglas. Oh, that Michael Jalaman. Ja Michael, real quick question. Yeah, real quick. Uh, I'm in Putnam County, New York, which is north of county north of Westchester. And we have a technological innovation, which we're still keeping quiet, and multiple markets where we could license the technology or go into the market ourselves. Is that something that might be of interest to you? It's not the normal venture kind of thing where we've picked the market and and we know that that's what we're committed to and we're not going to divert ourselves from other markets where we, where we could license. But any comments? Yeah, by, we always are interested in learning more about companies that are in all areas of New York State and Midwest. Again, we can invest anywhere in the U.S. or Canada, but we tend to focus on communities where we have relationships that can help companies scale. Just send me, you know, send me, send me some more information. It's my first name at armorysb.com, and I'm happy to set up a time for us to chat uh, to see how we can help. Okay, all right. that's Thanks great. A lot. Yeah, that's really wonderful. Okay, now let me um, thank everyone for joining us today. And the show went really fast, I thought. So that's a good sign. And I think I would like to just uh, thank everyone again and tell you about what we got going on coming up. Um, my next stop is going to be uh, Austin, Texas. Totally different market, but a uh, very happening place. Uh, we're having a show. Um, I'm actually speaking there on Friday, March 8th. And then we're having a barbecue social at a ranch on March 10th. So you can check it out <laughs> on our website, SiliconDragonVentures.com. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's global venture capitalist uh, and founders and deal makers. And um, yes, so there are people who are on this Zoom today who are going to be there. And so Mike is one of them. And so is Preston. So we That's appreciate right. your support for that. Thank you. Um, and then our next Ask a VC show is already scheduled March 14th, 4 p.m. East Coast time. Uh, Ron Levin, a uh, Harvard Business School guy uh, who has got a new book out, Higher Purpose Venture Capital. He's going to be on March 14th. You can already sign up for that. And uh, yeah, look, um, we hope to see you again on another show. And we'd like to thank Somak for all of his very uh, insightful perspectives. Um, I learned a lot and I'm sure other people did too. So we're gonna keep going with this um, meeting format. And so we'll see you again, March 14th. And uh, let's give Somak a round of applause. Thank you so much, Rebecca. I appreciate you putting together. I appreciate all the work you do to profile you know, some of the stories in, in areas like middle America and looking forward to seeing you at the barbecue. Really enjoyed our discussion. Absolutely. And, Austin. And thanks for everyone's questions. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Take, awesome. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye bye.